sure, but she had a young son who was with her as well. Now, as the story went, uh, apparently the uh, caretaker used to flirt with this woman on a consistent basis. It was very innocent, nothing bad. But one day he'd been drinking and he got aggressive with her. And she either slapped or hit him, one of the two. And she went back to her room, slammed the door and locked it. Well, he became enraged and he took a shotgun, kicked down the door and shot and killed her and shot and killed her son in the room. The thing that he didn't realize in this blind fury, this drunk rage that he had was there was no way he could get the bodies out of the location. There was always something downstairs. It was impossible. So eventually he kept drinking and decided to turn the gun on himself, dry gray matter on the ceiling. That's how it all ended. Now, what's interesting about this case was when we spoke to the woman and we spoke to her son and explained what was happening, they moved through very easily. They crossed over, boom, gone. The man was a completely different story. He remembered everything up to the point of the suicide. So what was happening was he thought that he was still alive. He thought that he was living out the same day over and over and over again. And when we would come in as investigators, he would think that we were ghosts and we were demons there to punish him for what he had done. We had one investigator, she was about five foot tall, short brown hair. No matter what question she asked on EVP, he responded the same way. He'd always say, it's you. Because he believed that this woman, our investigator, was the spirit of the woman he had killed coming back to haunt him. He really believed that. So that's where he came. What year were you born? June. Oh, this was an interesting case. Uh, whenever we get invited in to do an investigation, first off, we never charge. That's number one. Uh, if somebody tries to charge you to come in and investigate your home or your business, run the other way. Okay, just that's not how this works. Uh, secondly, when people contact us, we don't want to know anything about what's happening in the location. That might sound crazy, but the fact is, once they tell us we have paranormal activity, we stop them right there. The reason for that is, if somebody tells you what's happening inside the location, if you're a skeptic, you're going to debunk it before you ever go in. If you're a believer, you're going to justify it before you ever get back in there. So we go in as cold as possible. Now, in this case, we went in and we were able to capture quite a bit of paranormal activity. We went back to the owner, Nancy, and we said, does this make any sense to you? And she goes, yeah, it does. She explained to us that her and her mother had never been close in life, but her mother actually passed away in her home. And even at the end, they weren't close. So when we did the EVP session communicating with her mother, I just kept asking the question over and over, is there anything that you want to tell your daughter, Nancy? And this is what came through the speakers. Now, once this played out into the room, the activity stopped almost immediately. It's the last thing she had to pass on to her daughter before she could cross over, and that's why she was desperately trying to come through and speak to her. <laughs> One of my favorite EVPs of all time. Yeah. Um, as I told you, my father's a skeptic, and or was a skeptic, I should say. And when we would go in and do investigations to begin with, he thought we were crazy. He thought it was a comedy act to him. And we were actually in an old man. She trying to communicate with a woman's spirit. She was not coming through. She was not talking to us. And eventually, he got frustrated with us even sitting there doing it. So he burst into our circle and goes, you wanted to talk? And I said, yeah, that's why we're here. He goes, hey, lady, what color are your underwear? <laughs> <laughs> she, yeah, she talked. What is he do? Tell her what he's doing now. <laughs> to tell you how things have changed in this world, uh, yeah. my father, the skeptic, uh, has now had so many experiences and seen so many different things. He runs the Capitol Hill Ghost Tour in Denver. <laughs> That's how far things have gone the other we way. We won him over. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> This was an interesting one. Uh, we were contacted by a couple who had just built a custom home. Uh, we went into the location and uh, we found a lot of activity, including the partial apparition of a little boy that was running through the location. And we immediately started to try to, try to figure out what might be happening. Was it so, a possessed item? Was there somebody there who was haunted? What was taking place? And it was my mother who actually came back and said, we got to check the land records. And that's what she always says, yes. check the land records. Exactly. Guess what? Before this house was ever there, many, many years, there was actually an old house that was on this location that burned down, killing a family of four. And we believed that we were actually seeing the little boy running through. So when we did the EVP session, I just directed my questions at the little boy because he wanted to be seen. I said to him, do you know that this isn't your house anymore? And this is how he responded. And once that came through, we were able to speak to him 
eventually get him to cross over, which led the rest of his family to cross over as well. That says for Frank Sumption, the ghost box, the telephone for the dead. <laughs> My first question to you tonight, what is your name? I know you're ghosts. Could I have the spirit of the woman come through that answered yes and tell us why she's suffering? She's possessed. Is this your lover? One of these women, your lover? Fascinating story, at least for me it's fascinating. Um, Thomas Edison's telephone to the dead. How many people knew that Thomas Edison was actually working on this device by show of hands? Thomas Edison? Mm -hmm. Quite a few people. Yeah, this is much more than we used to get. That's awesome. Okay, so I'm going to tell you a quick story about how this all came to be. Um, Thomas Edison and his mother were very close, and I'm going to tell you the reason why. Um, it turns out when Thomas Edison was very young, he had brought a note home from his school and he handed it to his mother. She read the note, put it away. And he said, Mom, what did, this, what did the letter say? And it says, Thomas, it says that you're far too smart to be in the school that you're in. I'm going to have to homeschool you or I'll have to send you to a school for special children. He said, okay, Mom. And then, of course, Thomas Edison went on to do everything that we know Thomas Edison did. Now, when she passed away, she was a spiritualist. And he, with the scientific mind, the inventor's mind, never really saw eye to eye on that point, but they were very close throughout life. Now, when she passed away, he was going through her effects. And while he was doing this, guess what he found? That letter. He opened up that letter, and it basically read, Thomas is too stupid to be in the school that he's in. You need to send him to a school for special children, not smart special, the other special. Mm -hmm. So at this point, Thomas Edison realized at this point that this was very important, and that if she wouldn't have given him that information, he would have never gone on to do all the amazing things that he had done. It would have been such a uh, confidence uh, drain for him. So he took it very seriously, and he started looking at her views more seriously. So he decided that he could not only build a machine, build a machine that would actually bring through the voices of those people on the other side, but their actual personalities. And he thought he could measure spiritual energy in what he called life units. Um, so he talked about his work in Scientific American. He talked about his work in Forbes. He made it very public. And his contemporaries went crazy. They did not want this information out there because they thought it would tarnish his name and his reputation. So when he died, they didn't find a machine, they didn't find uh, uh, blueprints, mm -hmm. and all the meticulous notes that he used to keep were torn out and destroyed. So at this point, it became a legend. Now, over time, uh, psychic mediums were saying that Thomas Edison was actually coming through to them and telling them how to build this telephone to the dead, but unfortunately, none of them had the technical ability to actually do this. So once again, it was all just legend. Now, how I got involved in this was a pretty interesting story. Um, I was actually um, on Yahoo Groups. Anybody remember Yahoo Groups going way back when, before Facebook, right? And uh, I had put up a posting in the supernatural paranormal section looking for people to help me decipher a very specific type of EVP. And it said EVP specialist needed that I put up my help wanted app. A lot of great people responded. Some people I still work with to this very day. One man by the name of Frank Sumption wrote me back in the email, and it was the nastiest, meanest email I've ever received in my life. Basically, he said, I was an idiot, I needed to get out of the field, I didn't know what I was doing, so on and so forth. I took offense to this. Yeah. I wrote him back just as nasty of an email, and it started the greatest flame war in flame war history. Uh, the two of us fought back and forth for months and months and months. Eventually, one day I was in my office, my mother came walking by, she goes, who are you, who are you talking to? And I said, yeah, it's Frank, he told me this. She goes, enough, quit it. So I wrote him back one last email, and I said, Frank, you stay on your side of the street, I'll stay on mine, thank you very much. Frank, being Frank, wrote me back one more email, and he basically said, you may wonder why I'm such an expert in EVP. I've actually completed Thomas Edison's Telephone to the Dead. I laughed, and uh, I waited a little while, but I sent him back an email, and I was serious when I wrote it, and I said, Frank, if you've really completed this Telephone to the Dead, I will fly to any location that you are in the world to see this thing work one time. Turns out that it was 15 minutes from my office. True. <laughs> True. True. Gotta love the internet. So, we decided at that point to set up a formal meeting. Uh, and of course, the only place you can do that, International House of Pancakes. Um, so, my father and I got the suits on, we got the briefcases, the laptops, and out we went to IHOP. And when we showed up there, there was Frank.
like like that. Yeah. And uh, once he saw us in the suits, he panicked a little bit. He thought we were some sort of government agency that was coming to take him away. Mm -hmm. So he, once he was convinced that we weren't FBI or CIA, he decided he could tell us the story about how this all came to be. And he was with his wife, Norma, and they sat on one side of the booth, and my father and I sat on the other side of the booth. He told me the most amazing story I've ever heard, even to this day. Basically, Frank said that he was a shortwave radio buff. He liked to, to do things with shortwave radio, and he liked to build home electronics, different things with that. So uh, one day he was reading an article in a popular science magazine about the voices of the dead coming through shortwave radio experimentation. So uh, he set up the experiment just to debunk it and then write in a letter about how bad this was. This is kind of his MO, what he used to do. So he set up the experiment the way that they told him to, turn the thing on, and then at that moment, it called him by his first, middle, and last name. He shut it off, thinking he lost his mind, walked away for about <laughs> six months, but eventually came back just to see what was there, turned on the machine. Now apparently, when he turned the machine back on, it wasn't just calling him by his name, it was telling him how to complete Thomas Edison's Telephone to the Dead. Circuit boards, diodes, schematics, things along those lines. Frank, being an eccentric guy, decided that he would actually build the machine to their specifications. And apparently he went and built the machine, turned it on the next time, and it was better sounding than what he had before. So they told him how to build a better version of that device. So, you know, you have to kind of picture the scenario. My father and I sitting across the booth from this guy and his wife, and he tells us this amazing story. And we were trying not to laugh at this point because it was just so outrageous. So I turned and said, wow, Frank, is there any way that we could go down and see this work sometime? He goes, yeah, come down to my workshop next weekend. Next weekend came. We showed up at his house. The workshop was located in the basement of the house. As we're walking down the stairs, the only way to describe this place is like a cross between a bad 1960s sci-fi movie and Deliverance, somewhere right in those two. Um, there were um, speakers hanging from the walls. There were wires hanging from the walls. There were fur pelts. There were crossbows. And as you walked into the main room, just to complete the total insanity, there's a gigantic tinfoil pyramid hanging from the ceiling. And I turned to my father and I was like, we're not gonna make it out alive. <laughs> we walked into this room and I looked over to my left and there's one of those gigantic 1980s Manila computer towers. You remember those, the huge ones way back when? And I saw this thing and I looked over to the side and it had lights and buttons and whistles and it, all sorts of different things and a little wood speaker up on top. And I thought to myself, oh God, please tell me that's not it. And as I walked over, he goes, this is it. I was like, oh. So we walked over to this thing. He goes, you want to hear it work? And I was like, oh, I guess so. So he flips this big silver switch on the front, and it makes this warm-up sound. It's like, whoa, 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 whoa. And then through the speaker, it sounds like somebody's taking a radio and just tuning the dial back and forth and back and forth. The realization hits me at this point. This man has built a broken radio and he thinks he's talking to ghosts and aliens through it. It's probably time to go. So I looked over at my father and he's like, I'm like, okay, Frank, thank you so much. This is awesome. We're gonna get going, but thank you for showing us this. We turned our backs and we started walking out the door. From behind I hear, wait! And I went, oh God. And I turned around and there he's standing kind of postured. And he said, the voices said you're supposed to take this with you. The voices. So. At this point, I reach into my back pocket for my wallet. I'm like, how much does somebody owe you for something like this, Frank? He goes, you don't get it, do you? I'm like, no. He goes, they say that I'm supposed to stay here and build these things. But you, you're supposed to take it out and talk to ghosts. Most awkward silence that's ever occurred. We just stood there and stared at each other for you a very long time. Minute. Exactly. <laughs> panic. Panic. Finally, my father and I got the, the guts, or whatever it was, to grab this machine. It was about 150 pounds between the two pieces. Got it out of there as fast as we could. We got it out to the Jeep, slammed it, closed the door, and started driving away. And Frank was still in the driveway, waving his arms and yelling and everything else. So as we're driving away, I'm thinking to myself, what a crazy experience. We're having a near-death experience talk. You know, that one is, oh, did you see the pyramid? Oh, my God. And we're driving down the road. And I'm thinking about this machine that's sitting in the back and the fight that we had. I thought to myself, you know, Frank's like an electronics genius. I said, what if he didn't build telephone to the dead at all. What if he built like a dirty bomb? And we're driving away. <laughs> <laughs> telephone to the dead. <laughs> we did not explode. No. We did not explode. No. So we got this thing back to the office at the, and put it on the shelf right by the front door and sat there for a year collecting dust, a solid year. And we would laugh about it when we walked past it. We didn't think there was anything to it. 
So a year goes by. Uh, we're getting ready to shut down for the holidays uh, the following year. And we had a huge investigation coming up at the Sally House in Atchison, Kansas. It was our third time going back out there. And we thought this was going to be the time that took us over the top. We thought we had enough information to really track the case.